Okay. All right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the psychology of hand gestures. Uh, I'm going to introduce what these hand gestures actually are and how we study them in uh, the field of psychology. So today I'm going to cover uh, these areas in the outline. Um, I'll first look at what exactly are hand gestures, uh, the types and functions of hand gestures, and gestures in instruction and the effects of these gestures on learning. Okay, so consider this question, what exactly are hand gestures? The tradition that um, I come from, okay, uh, it's born from David McNeil's idea. So he's a linguist and uh, he had this idea, this proposal that uh, gestures actually show the image that cannot be expressed in speech. So when people gesture, they're actually telling you information. They are, they are providing meaning that doesn't necessarily come out in their words. Okay, and uh, this was quite groundbreaking um, at, at the time because few people actually uh, looked at hand gestures that occurred with speech analytically. Uh, they tend they tended to um, they noticed that people move their hands, but they didn't really have ideas of why and um, no one actually thought seriously about looking at the role or the function of these hand movements uh, in accordance to the message that the speaker is trying to convey. So for this talk, uh, I'll just scope the definition of what exactly I mean when I talk about hand gestures. These are hand movements that co-occur with speech. So we're talking about um, in the process of regular speech when the speaker moves their hands. And um, in terms of hand gestures, I, I do know that uh, there are other forms of gestures in the literature. So uh, there are researchers who actually examine like hit gestures, hit movements. Uh, there are researchers who look at feet movements. But for this talk, I will focus mainly on hand movements. So gestures that co-occur with speech. Okay, so if we consider the idea, right, that gestures can reveal meaning not accessible in the speaker's words, um, then where does this meaning come from? Okay, so um, there's this idea that gestures are a form of action. And because they are actually a motor um, movement, okay, they are in uh, the, the visual uh, motor modality. So what gestures actually reveal uh, the kinds of actions or uh, visual features in people's minds that might not be easily represented in words or that might be just simply more efficiently expressed in hand movements. So one of the um, studies I'm going to describe to you, okay, it involves the research question, are speakers' gestures influenced by action? So the idea behind this study, uh, we were wondering, okay, if gestures actually reveal the action representations that people have in their minds, okay, then if we ask them to describe events that have a different severity of action, okay, would that actually increase or change their gesture production? So what, uh, what we did for this study was to show participants videos of um, actions that were big versus actions that were smaller. And then we asked them to actually describe the events in the videos and we recorded uh, their descriptions. So we had the whole video recording and then we coded their speech and their gestures. And we, uh, we analyzed whether there was any difference between the descriptions of the two types of videos. Okay, so what kind of videos am I talking about? Okay, I hope uh, there are no, uh, there's no one in the audience with a phobia of spiders because the video that I'm going to show involves uh, two spiders moving across the screen. Okay, so the first, uh, the first spider, there's no audio, so don't worry if you don't hear anything. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the first video. Okay, this is the one with the small movement. And I'm going to play it again. Okay, so what we have here is a spider that is kind of like bouncing on the screen in a zigzag manner. So participants will show this video, which is very simple, and then they were asked to describe what they saw in the video. So most participants would just say a spider moved across the screen or a spider zigzagged across the screen. And what we wanted to do was to actually see if they represented the spider's manner of movement in their speech or in their gestures or in both. Okay, so imagine that I'm the participant and I just saw this video of the spider zigzagging. So a, a typical participant would say, um, okay, the spider zigzag across the screen. Okay, some participants would just not move their hands. They would say that the spider zigzag across the screen. So then we have uh, two different kinds of output, right? We have a participant who um, is not so multimodal, who uses speech mainly to express event. And then we have um, a participant who is more multimodal and adds in some action with their hands to express their mental representation of what they saw. Okay, now I'm going to show uh, the second condition, which is the bigger movement. So it's also a video of a spider, but this time, okay, it's the same spider, but this time the spider is moving in a um, drastically different manner. Okay, I'm going to play the video again. All right, so in the second video, you can see that the spider was bouncing or zigzagging across the screen in, uh, in a bigger action. So the zigzags were not like small ones, but they were actually, uh, they covered uh, quite a big area of the screen. So what we, uh, what we were, thinking of is basically we wanted to see if participants tended to produce the zigzag motion with their hand gestures more often when they were describing the videos with the big zigzags than with the small zigzags. And in order for participants to not be influenced by uh, the difference in the movement, okay, we actually recruited different groups of participants for the two different types of videos. So one group of participants saw the videos with the small movements and a different group of participants saw the video with the big movements. So in this way, they wouldn't be influenced by the difference in the size because um, we were interested in seeing if the size of the action that you're describing, right, how salient or how obvious it is actually independently influences your gesture production. We, uh, we didn't want to have it confounded with the difference in um, size that you pick up from the experiment as kind of like an artifact. Okay, so uh, what we found, oops. Okay, so what we did was to uh, first quote the number of manner gestures that were produced in each participant's description. So we basically did a, a qualitative to a quantitative coding. Okay, we had um, two blind coders code for the presence of a zigzag manner in the participant's description. And then we counted how many times they produced the zigzag gestures across the trials. So we actually had uh, 10 videos of the spider zigzagging. It was zigzagging in different ways, so it wasn't the exact same video. Um, <clears throat> and then we compared the average number of zigzag or manner gestures produced by participants who watch the small zigzag videos versus participants who watch the big zigzag videos. And over here is a graph describing the results. So on the y-axis, I have the average count of manner gestures produced. Okay, you can see that participants on average did not produce um, 
that many gestures in their description. And that was kind of expected because the event was very short. So their descriptions were very short as well. So there wasn't a lot of time for them to produce um, many depictive or descriptive types of gestures. On the x-axis, we have the number of trials. So we had, uh, we plotted the, the count of many gestures across time. So as the, the video trials progress in the experiment, um, the participants kind of maintained their amount of gesture production. It didn't really drop off. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, so much a case of like they, uh, they were describing it the first time and then they, and then their gestures uh, reduced because they, it was a repetitive uh, behavior. Okay, they actually uh, were pretty consistent across time with their gesture production. And you can see over here that the number of big zigzag, um, sorry, the number of manner gestures produced for the big zigzag videos was actually significantly more than the manner of, uh, than the number of manner gestures produced for the small zigzag gest uh, actions. So this, uh, the results supported our um, idea, right, that gestures come from the conceptualization of action. So when the action is bigger, when it's more salient, um, people tend to be more likely to gesture about it. So they will be more likely to produce the meaning of that action in their hands. Okay, so um, I guess what's interesting about this study as well is that both videos had movement, right? Both videos had uh, the spider moving, but it wasn't necessarily the case that participants um, produce gesture regardless of the size of the movement. Uh, so it isn't always the case that when there is movement and participants are thinking about um, the event or they're representing the meaning of that event in their mind, right? It doesn't always mean that the movement, the meaning of the movement will come out in their hands. Uh, it seems to be dependent on the actual like size or the saliency of that movement. Okay, so... Uh, why did I start talking about this study? Okay, so I wanted to start with this study to show you that gestures produced by the speaker expresses the speaker's mental representation. Um, it's actually a way of producing meaning and because it expresses the speaker's um, thoughts, okay, uh, we have found that actually listeners comprehend meaningful information from the speaker's gestures. So because the gestures are a reflection of meaning and the speaker's thoughts, the audience or the listeners are actually able to pick up information about uh, what the speaker is thinking of at that moment in time. And uh, over here, the reference is a meta-analysis done on studies up to, uh, I think about 2010, um, on all kinds of research that was done on whether the listener or the audience picks up information from the speaker's gestures. So uh, like comprehension studies, um, uh, studies on memory. Okay, and in the meta-analysis, it was found that, yes, listeners do uh, comprehend meaningful information from a speaker's gestures, but it actually depends on uh, certain things. So for example, younger children actually make a richer use of the speaker's gestures. So uh, the effects of the studies done on younger children are bigger. And one of the um, reasons we might be able to think of is because younger children are less fluent in their speech and their verbal skills. So when they are less fluent with words, then what they do is they tend to use information that comes from other channels as well to actually construct the meaning of uh, what the speaker is trying to convey. Okay, so the other function of gestures, okay, um, is also to direct attention. So this function of gestures has been studied uh, since many decades ago, and it all comes down to the history of um, the study of pointing and how pointing drives joint attention. So I won't uh, talk too much about the history of this area, uh, but what I want to do is uh, to just impress upon you that the gestures can convey the meaning of things in terms of uh, physical features like shape, 
and it can also convey the meaning of things in terms of movement, action, and it also serves to direct attention. Okay, so these two functions bring us to uh, McNeil's categories of what kinds of uh, gestures are there. Okay, so uh, he calls the gestures that direct attention, dialectic gestures, and the gestures that show you uh, uh, physical features to be depictive gestures. So here is an example from one of the uh, qualitative studies that I was involved in. And in this picture, you can see an instructor uh, doing kind of like an inverted V with his hands. So what he was doing, so he actually teaches statistics. So what he was doing was to show um, the confidence interval that comes down from the point estimate. Okay, so he was using his gesture to actually depict the range of the confidence interval. And uh, this is one of the examples we've found in terms of how uh, teachers use their hands to convey information of what they're trying to say. Uh, and you might notice that um, very often the hands are used to show things that are not so easily described with words. Okay, so uh, for example, you might notice also that he has a blackboard behind him and he's holding some chalk. Okay, his fingers are stained with chalk. Okay, so if the board, you know, is full with uh, mathematical equations, right, and he doesn't have space to draw what he means, then he, uh, very often what the instructors do is they use their hands to represent, uh, to show. Okay, so that's why uh, it's important to remind students to look at the instructor when they're when they're teaching and not to be too uh, focused on their laptop okay and uh, be too <laughs> be too into you know taking notes and everything and you miss what the instructor is actually trying to show okay so in the next part i will go into more detail uh, on gestures in instruction and the effects on learning So instruction involves directing attention and conveying meaning at the same time, right? If you think of um, a teacher conducting a lesson, very often the teacher is trying to draw the attention of the students to actually show them uh, what's important, what, has, what should be learned, right? To convey um, her lesson. So for instruction, there's the, the act of directing attention and there's also the act of conveying meaning. And when we talk about conveying meaning in instruction, it's not just what the teacher is saying, it's also what the teacher is showing. So not just using um, uh, things that are on the whiteboard or not just uh, showing teaching material, but actually showing with the hands. So how we uh, conceptualize this is that we say that teachers highlight important information in the complex perceptual field of the classroom, right? They, um, when you think of the setup of a classroom, very often, you know, you don't just have the, the whiteboard in front. You also have many different posters. You have uh, materials stuck on the walls, right? And all these things. So if you have all, uh, all this kind of um, visual input, right, for the student's uh, perception. And if the student is also having their, you know, their electronic device or their textbook in front of them, then how do you actually um, kind of direct students to what is important in the lesson? Okay, so we have this idea that teachers highlight important information by using gestures. And the benefit of gestures is that it's a readily available effective means of highlighting. Okay, you don't need to know programming skills to be able to use your hands to effectively highlight teaching materials. It's there, it's instantly, uh, instantly usable, and importantly, it involves action. So this is a really um, special feature of gesture. Okay, it involves action with the hands. And what makes it special is that Action representations, okay, they are more engaging than static visual representations. They actually are able to convey a motion that might be something that the teacher wants to represent that's not easily um, describable with speech, okay, and also 
the gesture actually sieves out what's important. So sometimes if you uh, have education, educational videos for students, the videos might have all kinds of stimuli coming out of them, like colors, or music, things like that. But for the gesture, it's very easy for you to sieve out what's important. Okay, and uh, research has also shown that our hands are actually a privilege in terms of drawing attention. So uh, there's been um, previous work in cognitive psychology showing that visual attention is actually um, preferred around the hands. So when things happen around your hands, people tend to actually be visually attracted to it compared to um, other kinds of uh, visual stimuli. So common methods used for uh, research in gestures in instruction, right, um, involves the recording of classroom lessons. So more, uh, quite commonly for some studies, they uh, record what goes on in the classroom and then we do coding on the types of gestures that are produced by the instructor. So this would involve a qualitative kind of analysis, which is also <clears throat> what we did for the, um, for the study with the statistics instructor who had the chalk on his heads. So what was done was uh, we recorded several videos of um, an instructor, uh, different instructors giving intro to statistics lessons and then we coded their gestures and their speech as well. So this method, uh, the qualitative method is um, actually really beneficial in helping us to see how teachers enact their lessons and what kinds of gestures are most prevalent uh, for certain kinds of topics or certain kinds of lessons. So the recording of classroom lessons, however, is not sufficient for us to find out if students actually can learn from those gestures. And that's where the intervention experiments come in. So the intervention experiments involve quantitative analysis and <clears throat> Excuse me. So the intervention experiments involve quantitative analysis, and they're basically experiments that involve a pre-test and a post-test. And the intervention involves a video of the instructor giving a lesson that the student hasn't uh, come across before. And then what we do is we have different conditions of the lesson, and we vary the type of gesture that the instructor uses. Okay, so. Basically for the topic of gestures in instruction, um, both methods are equally important. The recording of classroom lessons allow us to see what kinds of gestures we might be able to uh, use for the intervention experiments. Okay, so for the next part of the talk, I'm going to describe two intervention experiments. And they're centered around math learning, uh, but towards the end of the talk, I will have a bit of discussion on how uh, the role of gestures in instruction is not confined solely to math or science. Okay, so for the first study, the research question was, can gestures help memory for math representations? So if gestures actually direct attention, right, and attention is required for encoding or remembering of information, then can uh, the instructor's gestures actually help students to remember uh, certain types of features in the math lesson. So we are having the idea that, you know, being able to remember features uh, helps them along with the lesson and helps them to understand. So it's kind of, kind of like a first step. Okay, so for this study, participants watch videos of an animated instructor point to uh, the intercept or trace the unit increase of a linear graph, and then the participants were asked to reconstruct the graphs on paper. So the math uh, topic that we are looking at is um, straight line graph. So we looked at how uh, students could learn about translating the abstract equation to the actual plotting of the graph. And the two conditions that we had here was uh, whether the instructor was pointing to the intercept of the graph or tracing the unit increase of the graph. So the unit increase is basically known as the slope. And the procedure sequence 
as I described, we had a pretest where participants did um, equivalent kinds of um, memory questions. Okay, and then they watched the question, uh, they watched the lesson, and then they did a post test where they did uh, questions that were different from the pretest, but they were equivalent in the type of questions. Okay, so here are two uh, screen captures of the two condition videos that we used. In the top screen capture, the instructor is pointing to the intercept of the straight line graph. Um, and you might be wondering, why is there a curved line above the straight line graph? That was to make the task a bit more difficult by providing a visual distractor. So participants were supposed to just uh, draw the straight line graph. Okay, and in the screen capture below, the uh, instructor is pointing to the unit increase. So it's really the, um, the small little black arrows that you see. So her finger was doing like the over and up gesture to show how many units um, of Y increased per unit of X. And everything else about the lesson was exactly the same. Uh, so we, um, the, one of the reasons for using this animated instructor was to kind of control the, the speech, um, the speed, and also the instructor's gaze. So here are the instructions that the students saw. And this is the answer sheet that they were given. So this is the response that they're supposed to draw the straight line graph um, on the graph paper. Okay, so pretty straightforward. And what we found were, uh, was that students uh, actually recalled the slope of the linear graph better when the slope was depicted with gesture. So that was in line with our expectations because uh, the gesturing of the, the slope provided students with a multimodal representation of the slope, right? Whereas if the instructor had just gestured or pointed to the intercept, that was not providing information about the slope. Okay, so. <clears throat> Once again, this is um, how the gesture of the slope looked. The instructor did the over and up gesture. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so if you're wondering about the intercept, okay, did students uh, remember the intercept better when the instructor was pointing to the intercept? Uh, one of the limitations of the study was that the intercept was too easy to remember, so we had a ceiling effect. Okay, with that, uh, we couldn't find a difference, um, but there was a difference for the slope. Okay, so that was a study that showed how gestures in instruction can be helpful for memory. Um, however, one of the research that uh, we did, right, actually found uh, results that were contrary to the idea uh, and <clears throat> highlighted the case that not all gestures can be helpful for learning or memory, uh, which is an important point because we need to really figure out in what context um, are these hand movements useful and in what situations might they be not useful and why so the uh, this finding came from a study with the research question um, does teacher gesture to graph and or equation lead to better problem solving in students the design of the study is very similar to the previous one okay so <clears throat> Sorry. So what we did was we developed a single verbal uh, lesson script and a set of images, but this was with uh, a human instructor in the video instead of using an animated uh, pedagogical agent. Okay, so in, uh, in these scripted lessons, okay, what, uh, what we did was to provide students with connections between the graph and the equation uh, by pointing. So the instructor used um, pointing and tracing to depict uh, the graph and to depict the relationship between the graphs and the equations. So over here, uh, we had four conditions. Okay, um, it's a two by two design. So in there are four different videos. Okay, in <clears throat> one set of videos, the instructor gestured to the graph and the equation. In another set of videos, the instructor gestured to the graph only. 
In a third set of videos, the instructor gestured to the equation only. And in the final set of videos, the instructor did not produce any gestures. So it was, um, it was a video with only speech uh, for the lesson. So what we were um, expecting was that the more gestures the instructor produced, the better students would learn. Because uh, initially we felt that um, instructor's gestures, you know, besides conveying meaning, was actually quite engaging. So we expected the um, gesture to graph and gesture to equation uh, condition to be the most engaging for students. And so we uh, expected them to have the best uh, learning in that condition. And once again, we had a pre-test lesson, post-test design. Okay, so over here, um, this is a screen capture of uh, what I mean when I say the instructor is pointing to the equation or gesturing to the equation. So the instructor will point to um, a part of the equation as she is referring to that portion in her speech. So the gesture and the speech is synced up in terms of the meaning. And over here is um, a screen capture of what I mean when I say the instructor is gesturing to the graph. So over here, she is uh, showing how the straight line graph begins from the intercept. And then what she's gonna do is uh, she's going to actually trace out the, uh, the line. So uh, for pre-test and post-test, we had 10 problem solving items. Uh, to assess the understanding of the links between the graph and equation. So this um, study was not just interested in memory, but it was actually looking at whether students could make the link for problem solving. And here's an example. So uh, an example of the problem solving uh, question where students had to graph, and this would be what the correct response would be like. And here's an example of another problem solving question where students had to write the equation for the graph shown. Okay, and this would be the correct response. So what we found was uh, very surprising for us. Okay, uh, we found that watching the teacher point to the equation during instruction actually hurts problem solving. So it was not the case that the gesture to graph and equation condition produced the best outcome for students. In fact, uh, we found that the, when, when we did the ANOVA and the analysis, we found that actually when there was gesture to equation, students' uh, problem solving was actually the poorest. So then we were wondering why. From the whole um, from the whole body of literature, right, it does suggest that teachers' gestures are generally beneficial for students' learning, but it appears that the effect may depend on the nature of the representation and several other things. So one of the potential explanations we had was that when too many gestures happen, um, too much information is coming in. And so there is a cognitive overload on students. Okay, and um, the reason for that, right, is because when we think about pointing, gesturing to the equation, okay, or gesturing to a statement that students can easily read off the board, okay, um, just saying that, uh, reading the equation or reading the statement itself already directs students' attention to it. So for example, if I'm the instructor and I want students to attend to the equation in the lesson, okay, if I just say y equals 2, students will orientate and read y equals 2 on the board. Okay, so it appears that the pointing, the extra pointing gesture actually uh, creates this detrimental effect. However, if I'm trying to draw students' attention, uh, or I'm trying to depict something that's not so easily readable, not so easily produced in speech, or um, it could be that the students I have are not at that level of comprehension yet for um, verbal skills, then perhaps gesturing to the representation, the item on the board actually helps them. Okay, so um, one of the potential, one of the explanations we had for this surprising finding was that, you know, if you can uh, 
produce, if you can convey meaning sufficiently in speech, then maybe adding additional things is kind of being too extra with students and it could actually uh, cause them to um, have information overload and not be able to uh, reach that point of learning that you want. However, if um, you feel that students need help with understanding or with um, orientating their attention towards something that, is, that isn't so easily uh, expressed in the verbal modality, right? Then perhaps using gestures, that's where it's most efficient. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've just described is the role of very generally um, a slice of how gestures could work in instruction. And what we see over here is that the teacher's gesture can help students to remember and comprehend parts of the lesson, and this can lead to better learning. Okay, and so uh, that's the end of my presentation. And here are the references if you are interested in looking at uh, the studies that I've talked about. Thank you so much for your attention.